Well, good morning once again, dear saints. Good to be together, isn't it? It's good to be here together around open Bibles. Let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. That's where we are today. Daniel 5. We're sort of blazing through this book, but it is one of the most important books in all the Bible. If you want to understand what the Bible has to say about those events which will precede, accompany, and follow the Lord's return, then you have to mastermind Daniel. You won't understand Revelation if you don't understand Daniel. And yet Daniel contains so much in there that is so helpful to us, so edifying and challenging, that I thought it was right to go through this book together. We're in Daniel 5. Now, remember what we looked at uh, last time, the man in charge was King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. That's where we are in Babylon, more than 500 years before Jesus was born. And Nebuchadnezzar was not a good person, was he? He was an absolute tyrant, an autocrat. He changed laws and policies on a whim. And uh, God knew how to reach that man. God knew how to humble him and apprehend his heart. And we saw a conversion last week in Daniel 4. But it wasn't easy. God was continually revealing himself to this uh, stubborn, slow-to-learn tyrant. And God finally absolutely humbled him for seven long years. He humiliated that king, took his kingdom from him, and later restored it when he brought that man back to his right mind. And I was thinking about how profound this is, that that wicked king was humbled the way he was and then restored. He deserved it. He deserved to be humbled. Not sure he deserved to be restored, but God is gracious. But think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an innocent, faithful, godly king. And wasn't he humbled? He was humiliated. Worse than Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was thought a maniac. He was thought as a person who's lost his mind. But Jesus was thought a blasphemer, and that's much worse. And we, we, we sung it. Jesus Christ was alone in the universe for six hours, bearing the world's sin debt in his body on that tree. And whatever else we teach here in this church, we're going to keep talking about that, the greatest message the world's ever heard. And we'll return to that before we're done our message today. So let's come now to Daniel chapter 5, beginning verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Who's this person? We have just got done talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Now who's this guy? Well, it turns out that Nebuchadnezzar at this point is long dead. He's passed on, and in fact, three kings have succeeded him already. See how the Bible just moves along in history? Just... And so some time has passed, and now the man in charge, really, in Babylon, is a man named Nabonidus. We don't see his name in the Bible, but outside the Bible, we understand he's the man that's really in charge. Now, he had a problem. He did not worship the Babylonian gods. In fact, he worshipped the moon god called Sin. And it might be for that reason that he felt very uncomfortable in Babylon. So he put himself in, into a kind of self-imposed exile. And he left his son, Belshazzar, in charge. And, that, and for, for years we didn't understand this, but now archaeology has uncovered some things, and now we understand this, the situation there politically. And it turns out that this man, Belshazzar, is completely useless as a leader. Let's read about it. Verse 2. Ready? Verse 2. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now you get the picture right away it's at the beginning of the chapter that Belshazzar is a, well, as a leader, he appears completely useless. <laughs> I mean, can we just say it? 
He is a crowd-pleasing uh, pleasure seeker. That's him. Uh, he doesn't really have Babylon's best interest in mind. He's just, can we say it, it a party animal. There's, there's, do people still talk like that? Am I showing my age? Party animal. That's, ne that's Belshazzar. And the man is completely without wisdom. Uh, he praises the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. He prays those gods. In other words, he's speaking to his guests about their attributes, their histories, their deeds, their exploits. And you can hardly imagine anything more stupid than that. A piece of gold can't do anything. It can't talk, can't walk, can't accomplish anything. Wood doesn't do anything. Silver doesn't do anything. It just sort of sits there, effete. And yet these people have absolutely deceived themselves into thinking that these material objects are gods to be worshipped. Incredible. Major theme in the Bible. The darkened understanding of the unregenerate leads them to worship created objects. You read Isaiah chapter 44, if you like to do homework, Isaiah 44. is a, a good portion of the chapter dedicated to the stupidity of worshiping and loving material objects that can't talk, walk, or do anything. And in fact, you just see how, how diabolical Satan is when the Bible prophesies to us concerning a day future to our own, when Satan will command the building of an image made in his honor, and that image will appear to come alive, and it will talk and speak. It's, it's as though God, God is being challenged here by Satan. You say idols can't talk? Well, I'll make one that talks, and the world will wonder. So you just see how, how diabolical our enemy actually is here. But John, the beloved disciple, he says at the end of his first epistle, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's a major, major theme in the Bible. You know, you are supposed to use things and love people. Love God with everything you have and love people as you love yourself. Use things, love people. Never get it twisted around and start loving things and using people. That is sinful. That is not reflecting God's heart on the matter. It's okay to enjoy your stuff. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 says, God has given you all things to enjoy. Enjoy life. Life's meant to be lived. Enjoy your things. But remember the Lord's warnings here. In Luke 12, 15, he said, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And that is, I mean, that, that's a fighting statement there. Those are fighting words to this materialistic culture in which we live. But that's what the Bible says. And that really cuts cross grain uh, to the mentality that uh, largely prevails in our part of the world. But we say, yes, Lord, help us to order our thinking aright here. Well, look at verse 5 now. Let's see what happens. Something very amazing happened here in verse 5. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's almost comical if you read that. So proud, just loved attention. Everyone look at me. And now he is quaking at what has happened here in his own throne room. Verse 7 the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king its interpretation." Then, the king, then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance changed, and his lords were astonished. Suddenly, during his feast, an amazing supernatural occurrence, an intrusion into that event. A mysterious hand appeared out of thin air and began writing on the plaster of the wall in front of everybody. And this supernatural intrusion was absolutely terrifying. Can you imagine? It's completely unlike anything we've experienced. If it happened to us, we'd be terrified too, I'm sure. And the king was 
in a terrible conflict here. He desperately wanted to know what those mysterious words meant. He couldn't read them. He, he knew there was meaning here, but he didn't know what it was. He was desperate to know the meaning. He called all his wise men. He said, if you can tell me what it says, I'll reward you. You'll become third ruler in the kingdom. See? Nabonidus, number one. Belshazzar, two. And whoever can interpret these words, he becomes third ruler. But you know, this man is a bit schizophrenic because I don't think he really wanted to know. There are people like that. They're a little self-deceived. He said, I want to know what that means, but only if it tells me something that's pleasing to me, right? If, if that encourages me, then you tell me. But if it won't encourage me and endorse everything I've decided to do in this life, well, then I don't really want to know. I said, how do I know that? Because he didn't consult Daniel. Where's Daniel? Obviously, he knows about Daniel. You read that in chapter 5, verse 22. He wants to know, but that he doesn't really want to know. And friends, uh, nothing has changed. You know, 2,500 years later, nothing much has changed. He knows about Daniel. He doesn't want to know Daniel. The upright are abomination to the wicked. Even in the present hour, people are willingly ignorant of God and his opinions, plans, and purposes. That's what Romans 1 says. God has revealed the truth about his own existence to people. He has inscribed his moral laws on people's hearts. And what do people do? They deny and suppress these things by means of unrighteousness. And Paul says, and that is, it is for that reason that they will be without excuse on the day of judgment. Jesus said it in John 3, 19. This is the condemnation. Light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. They turn their face away from this. They don't want to know. This reminds me of Acts 24, when the Apostle Paul was called from prison to speak to Felix, the governor then, the Roman governor. And the text says that Paul spoke of righteousness and self-control and of the judgment to come. And you know what the governor did? You know what he did? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't say, what must I do to be saved? He said, Paul, go away from me. Go back to your cell for a little while. I'll call you when it's convenient. He didn't want to hear it. This is like Belshazzar. He doesn't want to hear it. It's a real problem today. The world that we live in today is a world in which everybody can be connected if you want to be. Social media has supersaturated the Western world, YouTube, Wikipedia, all kinds of websites, all kinds of resources. If you want to know about something, it's there. And what do people do? They polarize into their little special groups, like little isolated echo chambers and they just hear from people who they agree with and the same story true or not gets ricocheted around and no one's really learning anything you know ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth these people are absolutely terrified of anything that looks like intellectual diversity they are phobic and intolerant and sealed off they don't want to hear it that's what we have to contend with as ambassadors for Jesus in the last of days. Still we plead with them. You have to. Jesus said, do it. Tell them, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Be reconciled to God. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Come to God. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. We have a message for the world and even if they appear sealed off, you really don't know what God is doing in their heart of hearts. They might be primed and ready to hear all the words of this life in the gospel. Maybe, maybe. And so we say, yes, Lord, we're going to be faithful to you, even if it looks a little discouraging. We're going to be faithful, because that's how I got saved. I was quite sealed off at one time, and a faithful ambassador for Jesus came and met me in the gym one day and brought me to a saving knowledge of Jesus under God. See, it's, it's not for nothing that we do this. It's important. Now, what happened? Well, the king obviously didn't want to hear from Daniel, but the queen entered the throne room and said, hey, you better consult Daniel. <laughs> you better call in the big guns here. We need to hear from someone who can tell us something. And with some reluctance, the king called Daniel into his presence, and he offered Daniel some rewards. He said, okay, Daniel, if you can interpret 
that writing on the plaster there, I'll give you great rewards. You'll be third ruler in the kingdom. I'll give you a gold chain around your neck. You can look like Mr. T if you want to. <laughs> I'm showing my age this morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, listen please to Daniel's reply. Daniel has a reply here. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel said, King, keep your stuff. I don't want it. God's power and provision will be manifest right here, right now, and it'll be free of charge. And you see, that's just a little prefigurement of the gospel. That's why that theme runs all the way through the whole Bible. It prefigures the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Salvation is a free gift. You don't pay money and buy a seat in heaven. You don't buy a ticket. Uh, you don't appease God with your money. He gave you your money. <laughs> God owns everything. And it, again, it cuts right across the grain of man's prideful heart. Man thinks he can earn his way to heaven. He can make himself good enough. He can pay enough. And he can earn God's favor. The Bible says no way. Romans chapter 4. You just read that solid chapter dedicated to showing us in the clearest terms possible that salvation is a gift from God to us and you receive it on faith. And that, may, that is easy. I mean, put it this way. It's simple, simple, very simple message. Not easy because Christ just demands that you give him everything. <laughs> you want him to save you body, soul, and spirit? Then give him everything you are and let him make the changes that need to be made. But this is a theme that goes right through the Bible. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, you keep your reward, I don't want it. You keep the spoils of war. Elisha said to Naaman the Syrian, you keep your money, I will heal you free of charge, I will cleanse you. Peter said to Simon Magus there in Samaria, your money perish with you, said the great apostle. I don't want your money. Freely we've received and freely we will give. And no minister, no true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be greedy for money. Now that's 1 Timothy 3.3 3 and 1 Peter chapter 5. Your local pastor should not be uh, a money grabber. He should not be bludgeoning you to give to him so he can secretly dig himself a new pool in his backyard or something. We don't even pass a hat around this church. We just keep an offering box at the back. If God moves you, you can put money in that box. But we are not going to bludgeon people uh, to give and somehow uh, brainwash them into thinking that if they give X number of dollars that God is going to make them millionaires. Have you heard this kind? I've been in churches that taught that. Paul says, withdraw, this is First uh, Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. Paul says, withdraw from people who suppose that godliness is a means to material wealth. Paul says these people are perverse they are of corrupt minds, and they are destitute of the truth. Those are hard words, but I didn't say that. Paul said that. A true minister of the gospel of Jesus has the truth, speaks the truth, and will not be bribed into twisting, editing, adjusting the message that God has entrusted to him, come what may. He's going to give you the truth from the Bible, not to deliberately be offensive to people, of course, but if it turns out to be offensive, then he's sorry about that, but he's not going to alter the message. I have never cared. Can I just share something from my heart to you? Personal. From the day I started pastoring in this church and I gave up aerospace, that was my career. I was in aerospace, 20 years. I gave it up and a good retirement and a good wage and all that, and that just, I said, goodbye. I'm going to pastor here. I never cared from that moment till now, and I still don't. I do not care about my wage, whether or not, I, I mean, it doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't, that is so secondary. I've always been concerned, very concerned, that I teach this word properly. Because if I don't, I will give an account. And this is like serious. James said the teachers are up for a stricter judgment. And if I'm not rightly dividing the word of truth, Paul said, I will have reason to be ashamed before Christ at his coming. 
I take that very, very seriously. See? The money, who cares? God owns the world. He can supply our need. He promised, right? And that's just a little uh, example and encouragement to all of us. Don't worry about the material stuff. God provides. Worry about being a faithful, courageous minister of the gospel, an ambassador for Jesus. You represent Jesus. You're his hands and feet. You're his voice on the earth. You hold forth the words of life for people who've never seen the Bible or consulted its pages. We've been entrusted to do that. Come what may. That's the marching orders to the church of Jesus Christ. And we say, Lord, help us, please help us in these last of days, as the darkness is deepening, to be faithful to you and to communicate this word the way you would have it communicated, not warped, twisted, amended, adjusted to agree with the opinions of unregenerate fallen people. If it's offensive to them, then Lord, please, by your grace, adjust their thinking to get in harmony with this word to the saving of their souls. That's, that's the picture here, right? We're all on the same page, right? Praise the Lord. Well, uh, you know, Daniel talked to this king, and he recalled the experience of Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar. And he said, Belshazzar, you knew all about what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but you refused to humble yourself. He says that in verse 22. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And friends, this is also very important. We are morally responsible for what we do with what we know. Jesus said it. To him that has been granted much, much will be required. And don't you just sort of tremble when you think about all the privileges, luxuries that you have been blessed with, and me too. Every Bible study aid and help, it's at our fingertips, it's all here, commentaries coming out our ears, and how comparatively ignorant are we of the Word of God when it's all there for us. And we kill time doing this, that, or some other thing, and there goes, there sits God's Bible unopened. I think that we may answer for that. I don't think you lose your salvation, obviously, but at the judgment seat of Christ, when there is a review of faithfulness, God just may ask us what we did with our time and how much time did you spend consulting God's infallible holy word for instruction and guidance and correction. It, see, it's kind of a tragedy, isn't it? All the words of this life are here in the Bible. But friends, we're not just morally responsible for what we do with what we have, we're culpable if we do not learn from others' mistakes and sins. If you're made aware of something, a, a disaster somebody has wandered into, and you have clear understanding of the picture, and you just wander into the same error, you're responsible for that. That's what the Bible's telling us here. And this is exactly what's happened here. I want you to read this in verse uh, 23. Let's look at 23. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. This is Daniel to the king. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, uparsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And friends, that's exactly what happened in verse 30. It says that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Tragic end. Didn't need to end this way. This man could have acknowledged the God of heaven. He had enough information. He could have done it. He decided not to. He decided to find his, uh, just follow his own prideful pursuits. And I love how God is identified here at the end of verse 23. He is the God that holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways 
and you have not glorified him. And that's the problem in the world today, dear friends. God created us. He upholds and sustains us. He teaches man knowledge. He fills our hearts with wisdom so that we can learn things and navigate through this life. And very few actually turn their faces skyward to thank this God for his provision, for his grace, kindness, generosity. They turn their face away and they pretend like they're able to accomplish things autonomously without any help from him. God is displeased at that. And so he should be. So his judgment on Belshazzar came that same night. That very night, the Persians, the Medes and the Persians took over the kingdom. And listen to this judgment. I want us to listen to this very carefully. He said, Belshazzar, your days are numbered. Death is coming and judgment to follow. He said, you've been weighed in the balance and you've been found wanting. You know, the Bible says that about everybody. In Psalm 62 and verse 9, the Bible says that man is lighter than vanity. We just have nothing to commend ourselves to God. We're lighter than vanity. If I may say, that's pretty light. <laughs> he, said, he told um, Belshazzar, you're going to be conquered. And he was. Well, friends, can I say, this is, I mean, this is, again, this is all of us. Isn't this all of us? Uh, when we came into the world, we came into the world enemies of God, children of wrath, sin conquered us, we were held captive to sin, enslaved by it, conquered by our various lusts. I mean, that was me. Not proud to say it, but before the age of 20, that was me. But something amazing happened, and you know what it was. At a point in time, someone shared the gospel with me. At a point in time, someone shared the gospel with you too. And you learned that God entered the human family in the person of his son, Jesus. You learned that. And that Jesus led a sinless life. Nevertheless, he was taken with lawless hands. He was crucified and slain. You learned that. And you learned that he died there not for his own sins, because he had none. He died for your sins. He was paying your sin debt in full, mine too. And you learned that Jesus rose from the dead and he conquered death, hell, and the grave raised for your justification. And even now, in the third heaven, Jesus is interceding for you. He's praying for you. He represents you before God in the third heaven. Wonderful, wonderful blessings, mysterious grace shown to people who had nothing to commend themselves to God. And I just look at that and I say, Lord, I was under the same condemnation as Belshazzar. I was weighed in the balances and I was less than vanity. My days were numbered. Death was in my future. I was enslaved by my own sins as, as Babylon was to be conquered by the Medes and the Persians. But Jesus changed all that. Look at the picture now for those who love and trust Jesus. So far from your days being numbered, Jesus says you have right now eternal life. Jesus told Martha, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. Do you believe this? We say, we believe it, Lord. You are the resurrection and the life. We believe it. Jesus said, you trust in me, you've passed from death to life. A mysterious transaction has happened. You've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And you are supersaturated with life everlasting. Your days are no longer numbered. In fact, as we mentioned on Friday, death becomes no longer a fearful enemy becomes a vestibule into the beautiful place that God has prepared for you. My days aren't numbered anymore. Oh, I've been weighed in the balances. Guess what? I have been a recipient and am a recipient of Christ's own righteousness. Isn't that an amazing exchange? Our cup was filled with our guilt, a sin death. My cup was overflowing with condemnation filled with past deeds that I committed that were ungodly, wicked, evil. And God, for Christ's sake, took my cup and dumped it out and said, you're innocent. And he did more. Jesus said, allow me to fill your cup with my own righteousness. When God weighs you in the scales, he will see Christ's own righteousness imputed to your account. Didn't deserve it, but that's the plan. 
And we are no longer enslaved by sin and carried about by various lusts. Now we are Christians. We are strong. We are free. We conquer sin in our lives. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We cast down every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. That's what we are doing. That's part of the marching orders of the church, taking every thought captive in my mind and in those with whom I am interacting. And we speak the truth to people in love, truth that sets people free also. Freely we received, freely we give. Courageously, patiently, prayerfully, but definitely in your own little mission fields and mine too. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it amazing? We can read a dusty old story about a wicked king named Belshazzar and somehow we end up at the cross of Christ and all the saving benefits of what that man did for us, the man Christ Jesus. Incredible. Well, friends, uh, I'm done, and I don't want to keep talking because it'll just be me talking, but I'd like to seal uh, what we've done here with a word of prayer. I think we have a final hymn. Okay. Let's pray together, dear saints. Almighty God, we just come before you on your throne of grace with very grateful hearts. We want to thank you this morning for your precious word, the Bible, shining like a light in a dark place, showing us the truth, showing us where the blessings are, where the dangers are hidden so that we can navigate around them. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness in saving us and calling us to believe in you to the saving of our souls. We thank you that we're part of a big family, a household of faith. Thank you for all the attending privileges, responsibilities, and benefits of being part of your family. Uh, Lord, would you please fill our hearts with the strength and courage, with patience and love, and all those things that are needful for us to be faithful to you. Lord, seal the truths that we were confronted with today into our hearts and into our minds. May we not forget them. May we reflect on these things in the coming week, that we would be more in love with Jesus, more in awe of what he has accomplished and even yet will accomplish in the future. We commit these great cares and these requests to you today, dear God, in Jesus' precious and matchless name. Amen. Amen. Praise our great God. God bless you, dear saints.